Well, good morning and namaste, everyone. Welcome to the Hindu American Foundation's 2021 Virtual Advocacy Forum. And to kick things off, our first panel of the day, Pakistan on the Brink. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, my name is Samir Kalra. I'm the Managing Director of the Hindu American Foundation. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. We have a very exciting uh, program. Um, we will be recording and live streaming tonight's, this morning's program. But by participating, you agree not to record, disseminate, or in whole or in part, any part of the program without the express written consent of the Hindu American Foundation. We will be having time for a question and answer session towards the end of the program. So please use a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen for any questions, and you can just submit them at any time. And we'll try our best to get to as many as possible. Please do keep an eye out for important links that are gonna be sent through the chat function. And please do feel free to engage in a robust conversation in the chat, but in a respectful manner. Now, normally when we're hosting our advocacy forum, we're in person in Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, and we have several members of Congress addressing our audience. While we're not together in person today, we are very fortunate to have welcome messages from a number of members of Congress, which will be playing throughout the day. To start with, we wanted to share a few of those this morning. We have three congressional messages from Representative Brian Fitzpatrick, Republican from Pennsylvania's first district, Representative Gus Blarakis, from a Republican from Florida's 12th district, Representative Scott Peter, a Democrat from California's 52nd district. And Krishna, if you wanna please go ahead and cue those messages up. Hey everyone, Brian Fitzpatrick here. And as a friend of the Indian American community and a member of the House of Representatives India Caucus, I want to welcome you all to the Hindu American Foundation's 2021 Virtual Advocacy Forum. The Hindu American Foundation was established in 2003 and is the only Hindu American advocacy organization on Capitol Hill committed to advancing the interests of the Hindu American community. The HAF's mission is to promote dignity, mutual respect, and pluralism in order to ensure the well-being of Hindus and of all people across the globe. And I'd like to thank the HAF for their unwavering commitment to educating the public about the Hindu faith and Hinduism uh, and advocating for policies and practices that ensure the well-being of all people across our planet. In Congress, I will continue to work to strengthen the U.S.-India relationship and advocate for our Hindu Americans. I look forward to working with your communities as we continue this great friendship. Thank you so much and God bless. Hello, this is Congressman Gus Bilirakis, and I'm proud uh, to be a member of the House India Caucus. It is my pleasure to welcome you to HAF's 2021 Virtual Advocacy Forum. As co-chairman of the Congressional International Religious Freedom Caucus, I work to raise awareness and fight against religious persecution around the globe. I will continue to fight for these basic rights. Again, welcome to today's uh, advocacy forum, and I hope you will find it meaningful and productive. Good afternoon, I'm Congressman Scott Peters, and I represent Poway, Coronado, and most of the city of San Diego in the United States House of Representatives. Welcome to the Hindu American Foundation's 2021 Virtual Advocacy Forum. What a special occasion to celebrate and empower the Hindu American community across the United States. Over the past two decades, the Hindu American Foundation has grown as an important voice in the fight to defend civil rights, environmental justice, access to quality education, and broad immigration reform. In my home district, California's 52nd district, Hindu Americans play key roles as small business owners, educators, and leaders at some of our largest employers. The Hindu community also adds to the cultural diversity we celebrate in San Diego by organizing major Diwali and Holi festivals. Two months ago, I, along with local leaders from the Hindu American community, was pleased to welcome the Ambassador of India to the US, Mr. Chandranjit Sandhu, San Diego. We celebrated the first delivery of military helicopters and recognized the close defense cooperation between the United States and India. Earlier this year, I also introduced legislation to make it easier for family members from India 
to come to the U.S. for special celebrations. The Hindu American Foundation has been a reliable partner in the effort to get this bill passed, and I'm grateful for this group's leadership and collaboration. I will work to continue to strengthen our ties and uplift the Hindu American community. Thanks to the Hindu American Foundation for your support. Stay safe and be well. Well, thank you so much to Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, Gus Belrakis, and Scott Peters for those wonderful welcome messages to kick off our program. But now for the part that you've all been waiting for to our panel, Pakistan on the Brink. We have a star-studded panel joining us this morning who are gonna be discussing human rights, religious freedom violations in Pakistan, as well as terrorism and the ramifications of the Taliban-Pakistan military alliance in the fall of Afghanistan and the implications for the US and India. We're honored to have these panelists with us who come from diverse backgrounds and have expertise in a number of areas who are gonna talk a little bit more about this wide-ranging subject. To start off the panel, we have Dr. Michael Rubin, Michael Rubin is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he specializes in Iran, Turkey, and the broader Middle East. A former Pentagon official, Dr. Rubin has lived in post-revolution Iran, Yemen, and both pre- and post-war Iraq. He has also spent time with the Taliban before 9-11. For more than a decade, he taught classes at sea about the Horn of Africa and Middle East conflicts, culture, and terrorism to deploy U.S. Navy and Marine units. Dr. Rubin is the author, co-author, and co-editor of several books exploring diplomacy, Iranian history, Arab culture, Kurdish studies, and Shiite politics, including Seven Pillars, What Really Causes Instability in the Middle East, Kurdistan Rising, Dancing with the Devil, The Perils of Engaging Rogue Regimes, and Eternal Iran, Continuity and Chaos. And for the purposes of our panel, he's been writing a number of pieces recently on Pakistan and the broader South Asian region. Dr. Rubin has a PhD and an MA in history from Yale University, where, he also, where he's also obtained a BS in biology. Our second panelist is Fatima Gul. Fatima Gul is a seasoned Sindhi American human rights activist who serves as the executive director of the Sindhi American Political Action Committee. Born and raised in a village in Sindh, Gul began her career in the education and event management sector. For the past decade, she has made it her life's mission to raise awareness about the pressing human rights issues occurring in the province of her native Sindh, Pakistan. Gul's Gull, Gull, work is to educate and foster awareness through the U.S. about the critical human rights violations occurring in Sindh, including violence against women and children, religious persecution, and enforced disappearances. In 2019, she testified before the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee hearing on human rights in South Asia and recently took part in the Sindhi Foundation's 350 mile long walk for human rights and climate change in April, 2021. And last but not least, the Hindu American Foundation's very own Dipali Gulkarni is rounding out our panel. Dipali is a director of human rights at HGF. She holds an MA from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, an MST from Oxford University and an MPhil from Syracuse University. She was a 2018 recipient of the Fulbright Nehru Student Research Award with which she studied gendered religious practices in India extensively. We're gonna have each of our panelists start with five minute opening remarks. Then we'll then transition to a moderated discussion for about 25 minutes. And then we'll open it up to the audience for a Q&A. Again, please feel free to enter those questions at any time into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and our team will be uh, going through those and trying to send those out to me and I'll ask as many as possible and as time allows. And final, following the Q&A period, we'll come back to our panelists for some final closing remarks and then we'll close the program. So to get things started, I wanna to go to Dr. Michael Rubin to talk a little bit more broadly about the region and what's been going on there, which has been uh, quite uh, chaotic in the last several months. Uh, so, Dr. Rubin, if you can go ahead and uh, set the stage for us on what's happening in Pakistan and the region. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank the Hindu American Foundation. I want to thank you, Samir. Even though my career has focused much more in the Middle East as a historian, which means I get paid to predict the past, and admittedly, I may only get that right about half the time, I did spend a great deal of my time studying Indian history, uh, especially through the lens of Iran, but more broadly. So it's a real pleasure to be able to move a little bit into policy when it comes to South Asia as well, because it's an area in which I've always had deep interest. I may also be the only panelist that has spent much more time in Pakistan than and Bangladesh than I have in India. Um, and so 
my impressions and my policy views with regard to Pakistan are actually shaped from having spent a good deal of time there, including with um, it, as a guest of the Pakistani National Defense University and so forth. Let me just be upfront. Pakistani leaders are now living in an illusion. They, they have become completely detached from reality. First and foremost, the problems of Pakistan today are internal. Pakistani leaders and the Pakistani military may want to try to scapegoat others. They may want to look for the sources of their failures external to Pakistan itself. But the reality is these are just conspiracy theories. The real root of the problems in Pakistan are because of Pakistani policies. Pakistan has agency and they need to look themselves in the mirror if they want to understand the responsibility for some of the issues which they now face. Let me talk about terrorism for a second. Every country that uses terror as a tactic or uses Islamism for export only ultimately faces blowback. That was the case with Saudi Arabia, which had to pay the price not just uh, in the immediate wake of 9-11, but when they also started suffering compound bombings, for example, back in Riyadh. That was the case with Syria, which once allowed itself to be an underground railroad for jihadists coming into Iraq. And then it faced radicalism in its own country. And more recently, that's been the issue with regard to Turkey and um, with regard to the Islamic State. And because of Turkey's outreach to, to the Taliban, it's going to become even worse. And Pakistan is going to pay the price dearly. Pakistan has already lost thousands because of its own support for radicalism. And with Afghanistan now uh, solely a... Um, a state for radical groups like the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and the Islamic State, ordinary Pakistanis are going to pay the price. Pakistani elites live in a bubble. They may think that they still have control over this. And if I'm sitting meeting with the former head of the ISI in the Islamabad club, which is an oasis inside Islamabad, which itself is an oasis, you can be completely detached from reality. But on the streets of the Peshawar, on the streets of Pindi, and the streets of Karachi, it's a completely different story. Now, incentivizing Pakistan inside Washington has failed, and Washington needs to wake up to this. The ISI is directly complicit in terror groups, which have killed not only Indians, but Americans as well, um, more broadly. And the United States needs to stand up for everyone. It shouldn't matter who the victim of terrorism is. But in this case, the United States has a direct interest encountering this. We need to end major non-NATO uh, status for Pakistan. We need to um, apply Magnitsky Act sanctions, especially with regard to violations of religious freedom. It, it's amazing that back in the 1950s, the Pakistanis would celebrate Christian and Hindu holidays as national holidays. And today, people are being subject to forced conversions to um, terror on behalf of radical um, local radicals and so forth. Um, we also need, and this goes beyond terrorism, we need to recognize that Pakistan today is a vassal state of China. That is because of the miscalculations of the previous prime minister and also Imran Khan himself. And we need to subject Pakistan to the same dual use restrictions that we would with regard to computer and military technology to China. We should stop differentiating between the two because Pakistan itself has erased that line. Um, I would say as we look forward, and I say this in conclusion now, there's a danger moving forward in U.S. policy for folks. Uh, what we need to do is counter those who would say that we need to work with Pakistan to influence the Taliban. That's like working with the arsonist, uh, working with the firefighter when the firefighter himself is the arsonist. Pakistan will, I mean, when I've met with ISI people, uh, including former chiefs, they will actually laugh at this dynamic in which the United States finds itself. And we've got to get ourselves, extricate ourselves from this trap. We look pitiful when we play into their hands this way. We need to stand up for U.S. interests. We need to stand up for U.S. national security. And the best way to do that is with a strong partnership with India. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Dr. Rubin. And I think um, you've laid out <laughs> the situation very clearly um, and didn't hold any punches there. But I think that's what we need uh, given the current situation and given everything that's going on is some real clear reality um, in what uh, the ISI is doing, what the reality is there and what we need to do from a US policy perspective. Um, and I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of great questions from you in a little, for you in a little while. Uh, but with that, I wanna turn to uh, Fatima talk a little bit more about some of the domestic issues there with um, human rights, religious freedom, and some of the ethnic um, uh, issues that ethnic communities are facing on the ground in Pakistan. Fatima, you're on mute. Thank you, Samir. And I uh, also would like to take a moment to thank um, um, Hindu American Foundation. And I think these advocacy uh, you know, campaigns are very, very crucial to highlight the issues that we normally don't see in the mainstream media. Um, without the further ado, I would dive a little bit deep into what is actually going on, the more of numbers and human rights violations uh, when it comes to women, um, you know, ethnic minorities, um, the indigenous uh, people uh, that live in Pakistan. So um, in the eyes of uh, Pakistan's ruling class, almost invariably Punjabi Sunni Muslims, much of the state's resources were channeled into military interest over development of its young and fragile democratic institutions. Defense and intelligence agencies such as ISI quickly became the dominant centers of power, systematically dismantling civil society and undermining democratic institutions such as the judiciary and parliament, punishing the various non-Urdu speaking, ethnic, religious, and indigenous groups that did not reinforce Pakistan's identity as an Islamic Republic led by Urdu speaking Sunni, Sunni Muslim Punjabis, or uh, they call them good Muslims. Thus, Pakistani national identity became rooted in its own blend of militaristic Islamic fundamentalism. Gradually, the English common law upon which Pakistan had been established was integrated into elements of Sharia law, which codified persecution of those who were not considered good Muslims through notorious blasphemy, apostasy, hearsay, marriage laws, et cetera. So when we talk about condition of women in Pakistan, recently uh, 728 complaints of human rights violations were received from 2019 to 2020. Um, and in this annual report, uh, the 728 complaints of violation include various incidents um, like kidnapping, domestic violence, harassment, honor killings, and forced marriages. In May, 19, uh, May 9th, 2019 edition of The Guardian had written, there are many ways of killing a woman in Pakistan. You can stab them, shoot them, strangle them, down, drown them, explode the gas stove and make it look like a kitchen incident. Some women do survive because, of their, because their killers didn't use enough force or they were just plain lucky. There are many ways to get away with murdering a woman in Pakistan. The killer could claim that it was an honor killing. The woman had brought shame to the family. On June 27, a mutilated body of a 24 year old Sindhi woman named Wazira Chachar, who was stoned to death in a so-called honor killing case in Jamshoro, Sindh. Her post-mortem report revealed that she was gang raped before being killed. Only, only 243 rape reports were documented and uh, insignificantly investigated by police. Of these 243 reported cases, there have been zero convictions. There were reports that the, the practice of disfigurement, including cutting off a woman's nose or ears or throwing acid in their face in connection with domestic disputes or so-called honor crimes continued and the legal repercussions were rare. Pakistan is one of the worst countries for women in terms of economic resources. Women face discrimination for things like cultural, religious, and traditional practices 
practices and Pakistan has ranked for non-sexual violence, including domestic abuse. In Pakistan, 90% of uh, women experience domestic violence in their lifetimes. As of June 2021, 2000, 2,128 kidnappings in Sindh, 246 of which were children, according to the police. Of these reported cases, um, there have been zero convictions. In its 2020 country report on human rights, the US State Department, signif um, Department highlighted significant human rights issues in Pakistan, especially in Sindh region, which included unlawful um, or arbitrary extrajudicial killings by the government and enforced disappearances of Sindhi human rights activists. The report detailed that the human rights organizations reported some authorities disappeared and arrested Sindhis, Pashtun, Baloch human rights activists, as well as Sindhi and Baloch nationalists without cause or warrant. And when we talk about children and education, uh, a recent study revealed that more than 44% of children in Sindh are out of school. And we are talking about around 15 million uh, total um, students uh, from ages five to 16 years old, and 44% of these are out of school. Almost 100% of such uh, five-year-old children have never been to a school, and only 63% of the children um, who are 16 years old have been to school, according to the study. And um, out of, so 13 out of 29 districts in Sindh have an out of school children rate of more than 50%. Um, so we talked to, to date there, there are some 20,000 shelterless schools throughout the country when schools do have buildings, 60% have no electricity and 40% have no drinking water. Pakistan has the lowest school enrollment rate in all of South Asia. Um, the government closed schools and universities to prevent the spread of COVID-19, forcing classes to move online. Internet coverage remained inadequate, um, with 70% of the population have limited or no access to internet, especially remote areas like Sindh and Balochistan. This negatively affected the right to education of many students who were unable to join classes because of lack of equipment and limited internet access. Students in the city of Quetta, Balochistan protested call, calling for equal internet access uh, to be able to continue their education. At least 24 students were beaten and detained by the police officers. I will end there. Thank you, Samir. Great, thank you, Fatima. And we're gonna come back to you to talk a little bit more in detail about some of these ethnic issues that you alluded to, particularly Sindh and Baluchistan um, during our discussion. But thank you for laying the groundwork on some of the um, really aghast human rights statistics there and what's happening on the ground. Um, now I wanna to come to uh, Dibali Kulkarni. Dibali, if you can uh, walk us a little bit through specifically what's happening um, with Hindu minority girls and women and some of the challenges that they're facing who are also particularly um, in Sin province. Um, and walk us a little bit through that and set the stage on uh, the kidnapping and conversion, um, the systematic kid kidnapping and conversion of minority girls. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there are so many issues that need to be addressed in Pakistan and Michael and Fatima did an absolutely wonderful job of laying so many of the complexities out and the issue of forced conversion and the abduction of minority girls is yet another layer of the, you know, very important and significant human rights violations that are taking place in Pakistan that need to be immediately addressed. So at the heart of it, this violence is an intersectional violence. Uh, right now, violence against children, boys and girls is on the rise in Pakistan, as is violence against women. Violence against minorities has been a long-standing issue in Pakistan, and together, girls from these religious minority communities are facing the brunt of this violence. So the um, organization called Movement for Solidarity and Peace in Pakistan recorded approximately a thousand Hindu and Christian girls being stolen from their families annually. This would mean that since 2011, at least 10,000 girls have been abducted from their families and 
have lived lives um, of violence and lost their agency and their ability to live freely. So this commonplace violence takes place under the guise of conversion. The idea that these girls want to be converted is the you know, umbrella concept under which these uh, individuals, including clerics, um, individual men, are taking these girls from their homes in public spaces, forcing them to convert, which is usually certified from a mosque, forcing them to marry, despite being underage, which is usually sanctioned by a judge, raping them, and then for continuing to uh, separate them from their family and forcing them to live with their captors. And so while the umbrella, you know, the reason the justification for this violence is conversion, um, this is an issue of child trafficking. A really good illustration of this is a recent BBC story where a young 12 year old Christian girl was abducted, forced to marry and literally shackled uh, in the home where she was the wife. So this is not an issue of um, mar marriage or conversion or a desire of either of these things, which are used to obfuscate the realities of child trafficking. Now, um, this language of conversion serves many purposes. Um, it's the reason that's given for the clerics to actually uh, proceed with the abductions and the forced marriages, because the justification is that they want to be Muslim and actually um, forcing them to or having them marry um, Muslim men is, you know, providing them with the um, opportunity to pursue their uh, religious choice. And in addition to that, uh, the de desire for conversion is a justification for um, not allowing them to see their families because they're supposedly will be forced to reconvert to um, uh, religions such as Hinduism, which doesn't have a conversion process per se. Then there's an additional element to this when girls are uh, reconverting to uh, their original religion, Hinduism or Christianity, or simply admitting that it was a forced conversion and they were never Muslim, they risk being an apostate. And then there's an additional level of risk of violence and um, murder there. So there are many levels to, you know, and valences of this concept of conversion in these abductions. Clerics, clerics who wish to abduct girls do so under Sharia law, which they interpret to mean that any girl who has reached puberty is of marriageable age. By abducting and then immediately converting these girls, they become eligible for marriage in the eyes of the Pakistan government, who accepts Sharia law, and also has alternative laws which would ban underage marriage. These two systems of laws are at odds, and Sharia law is the one that is providing the guise for this child trafficking, unfortunately. Girls sometimes as young as 12 are taken from their families and never allowed to see their families again because of the illegitimate concern that they'll be converted back to Hinduism or Christianity per their family's belief. Conversion or belief is, of course, irrelevant when it comes to the welfare of the child, um, but is uh, provided as the justification for uh, all forms of these uh, violence, the abduction, the forced marriage, uh, forced and underage marriage, um, the rape and the uh, preventing them from seeing their family. Per the 1989 UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, parents have the right to care for their children and children have the right to be cared for by their parents and families. It's a very simple and um, easy to understand concept. But abducting and forcibly keeping children while the families beg for their children back is a commonplace occurrence in Pakistan where regardless um, of whether you know, the added violence of forced conversion and forced marriage are present factors, this is child trafficking. So there's a variety of issues um, here, but in short, the reason for these girls to be abducted is conversion. The overall objective is for them to be uh, converted and not to uh, remain as part of one of the religious minority communities that they're a part of to, uh, in many instances, impregnate them. And uh, that's why we see many of these girls being put in government shelters where they're still, again, not able to see their families, but uh, are forced to carry out their pregnancies 
after being raped as children. There are many um, ways in which freedom of religion and the right to convert is being used as a mechanism to uh, create this uh, violence factory for uh, underage girls in Pakistan. So I'm looking forward to addressing this issue. Um, and the Hindu American Foundation has done a great deal already um, to, to set the foundation for that and, and really work hard on bringing to light the issues that Hindus and other minorities are facing in this region. Great, thank you, Deepali. Um, you know, I want to start with you, Deepali. Um, you know, a lot of these conversions and abductions are happening specifically in Sindh province, um, which is where the largest Hindu population remains. Uh, what impact has that had on the demographics of the Hindu population in particular in Sin? Um, you know, given that, you know, these types of incidents are not just, obviously the primary victim is the girl and the family, but the larger victim is also the entire community um, in sending its message crime as well, right? It's intended to intimidate and either force the communities to leave or force them to convert. So if you could talk a little bit about how this has impacted the demographics and you know, what the community has felt about, you know, their safety and security because of these um, issues. Absolutely. The community has continued to face many challenges. Um, as I said, the minority communities are facing a tremendous amount of uh, violence. And then the girls, uh, at in general, all girls and women, uh, as well as young boys, are facing an increase in sexual and other forms of violence. So there's a, a you know, this intersection is really, really powerful because targeting the young girls is not just a way to, um, you know, create those girls as, you know, form them in the religious tradition that, you know, the uh, clerics imagine to be correct, but also to intimidate the entire community by taking the most vulnerable and threatening the most vulnerable within that community. And we see this, you know, not only in the forced conversions, but also the issue of you know um, the types of jobs that the Hindu, Christian, and Sikh communities are eligible for. There's certain jobs where only um, in, you know certain um, cleaning and other kinds of jobs which specify that these are for non-Muslims. And so the le levels of discrimination are really, really apparent in Sindh and really have created an environment that's extremely hostile for the already uh, disenfranchised and disadvantaged. Um, Hindu Sindhi community. In addition to that, there's this, this element of um, sex slavery, where many of these girls are also being sold into places like China and Iran. Um, recently, there was an, uh, the Pakistan police was actually able to stop 600 girl, more than 600 girls from being sold into slavery in China. And so, you know, as uh, Mr. Rubin noted, you know, the, the presence of China in Pakistan is, is something uh, very important to take into consideration. And this also shows up when these girls are being sold, you know, they're being sent as brides and then being, uh, and essentially what's happening under the guise of uh, marriage is they're being sold into sex slavery in neighboring countries. And uh, th this is happening not only um, when they're being abducted, but also unfortunately, because they come from disenfranchised communities, sometimes they're being sold by their parents as well. Fatima, is there any coincidence that a lot of this is taking place in Sindh, given that there has been a long time uh, or long term Sindhi nationalist movement as well, where there's a strong indigenous population and movement that have, you know, traditionally Hindus and Muslims have lived uh, harmoniously in Sindh and have a composite culture. Um, is there any coincidence that this is happening there, along with all these other human rights violations, given the culture, traditional culture of Sindh and some of what you talked about in terms of the Pakistani central government and military's um, attempt to suppress um, ethnic and religious minority rights. Yeah, it's very um, interesting because Sindh is known for, you know, um, uh, this peaceful society where people belonging to different religions have always lived for centuries together very peacefully. The whole object of, you know, um, again, it, it comes to being good Muslim and not good Muslim. So Sindhis are never considered good Muslims. And 
you know, most of the minorities uh, in Pakistan have always lived in Sindh. It's not like, you know, a new thing. They have always lived there. Millions of Sindhis had to leave because they were identified as Sindhi Hindus. They had to leave their homes and, you know, businesses at the time of the partition. Um, but I think it has a lot to do with the whole, uh, you know, scenario. Um, it is, it seems like a very well planned uh, when, um, you know, this Afghan war is started and the U.S. has started pouring billions of dollars into Pakistan and Pakistan, you know, and especially ISI became more and more powerful in controlling all these minorities, religious and ethnic, and also the indigenous communities like, you know, Sindhi people. So th that has been, you know, that has been seen and we have seen the, the rise in these abductions and forced conversions as a result of that in the last, you know, um, a decade or two decades, because the first high profile case that we saw was Rinkel Kumari, um, you know, um, a 16 year old girl abducted um, in, in, in Sindh. And moving next door to Baluchistan, uh, Michael, uh, you wrote a fascinating piece recently. So Baluchistan, of course, is home to the Baloch ethnic minority that has been involved in an armed insurgency for the last uh, couple of decades against the Pakistani state and has an interesting history in how it was uh, forcibly absorbed, at least some of the Khanates there, um, into the Pakistani state in 1947. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's happening in Baluchistan and you actually have advocated or you advocated in your article that maybe it's time that the U.S. support uh, the Baluch uh, movement and independence in Baluchistan and talk a little bit about why you took that position and what's been going on uh, specifically in Baluchistan. Well, in short, when it comes to what's going on in Baluchistan, the Baluch are watching their heritage again, being leased to China, especially with regard to the port of Gwadar. There has been sporadic um, and low intensity um, conflict and protests, which the Pakistani authorities have tried to mute. But as in other regions of, of Pakistan, while Pakistani leaders will like to believe that they are homogenous, the fact of the matter is the Punjabis act with ethnic supremacism towards every other ethnic minority inside Pakistan and the Baluch have traditionally felt the brunt of this. Uh, with regard to my article, look, I'm not in the US government. Part of the job of being in a think tank is to float those trial balloons, to um, float, make those arguments which people will say this is completely unrealistic only to have it then migrate into the mainstream. Uh, certainly this was the case, um, again, going into um, something a little bit more uh, far from India. When people a decade ago started questioning whether Turkey belonged in NATO, it was seen as a fringe argument. Today, it is center stage. I do think that uh, the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, as reprehensible as I think it was in the way it was conducted, um, gives an opportunity to, to fundamentally reconsider what the United States posture is to Pakistan. I would just say in conclusion, there's a danger in Washington, and this happens repeatedly, where we calibrate our policy towards what we wish countries would be or what they were in the past, rather than to what the reality of what they are today. And Pakistan is front and center here. It's important to judge Pakistan by its actions uh, rather than by its words, and to recognize just how far the ISI has guided Pakistan off the rails from what the intentions of Muhammad Ali Jinnah was uh, when Pakistan itself was founded. And there is some precedent for the Baluch um, issue in that in 1971, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, East Pakistan at the time, or now Bangladesh, to succeed, uh, largely due in part to this um, idea of uh, ethnic supremacy of the, of the Punjabi um, intelligentsia and military, and how that ended up suppressing the uh, uh, Bengali people, and it ended up in a horrible genocide, of course, and eventually independence for Bangladesh. Um, but there is some precedent for that in that Pakistan has kind of been a cobbling together of these very disparate ethnic minority groups with one group that has kind of really reigned supreme and looking at the rest of Pakistan almost as its own fiefdom. Um, in well, how it treats it. 
If I may, Samir, when I when I wrote the piece, you're absolutely right, and I cited Bangladesh as a precedent, and some people pushed back, of course, and said, well, the difference was, of course, that East and West Pakistan weren't contiguous. But again, there's other precedents here where you don't need to be contiguous in order to have your freedom recognized. That was certainly the case, for example, with Eritrea vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ethiopia, or if you want a more historical example, the issue of Kuwait vis-a-vis -vis Iraq. The fact of the matter is, um, there is an analogy there, and the fact that Baluchistan uh, is contiguous to the rest of Pakistan isn't a disqualifying factor. Now, a lot of people are wondering, you, you touch on this in terms of, um, you know, the way the ISI has been behaving. This is kind of one of our questions. I'm going to just jump to some of the questions because there are some really good questions. Um, but knowing the way the ISI has been acting and the military has been acting, knowing that they are, you know, laughing at us, as you have said, um, you know, what is driving our U.S. policy, our foreign policy? Why is it that we keep sticking to this idea that we need to continue this relationship with Pakistan as is? Not that we shouldn't have a relationship with Pakistan, but as is in that we keep turning a blind eye the havoc they're creating the re in the region. We keep uh, failing to hold them accountable for what they are doing in terms of sponsoring terrorism and in terms of destabilizing the region. You know, what is it going to actually take to drive our policy in a different direction? And why is there so much, you know, hesitancy to change that policy when everyone knows in these circles, in these policymaking circles, what Pakistan is actually doing? Well, I think there's three interlinking problems here. Um, one is this notion that um, perhaps the Michael Kugelman approach in which, well, these are the power dynamics and we have to utilize, um, we have to work through the existing power dynamics. Then there is this uh, naive notion that Pakistan isn't really what it is today, that we can look at the golden age of Pakistan at some point in the past and, and forget that Pakistan has fundamentally changed since 1971. And then there's the problem of what I would argue is the internal lobby. There are many different consulates in Pakistan, in addition to the embassy. Uh, people have spent their career there. They have been charmed by Pakistani diplomats and officials and internalized their narrative. This is one of, I would have two policy solutions to this in the long game. Um, and of course, the Hindu American Foundation is part and parcel of this. Number one, it's important to highlight what Pakistan has really become to attach stigma to what people are lobbying for uh, so that Americans don't naively um, attach their names in Congress to um, what Pakistan really is in terms of its racism, in terms of what we've heard from Dipali and Fatima, uh, its abuse of women, its abuse of minorities, and so forth. Um, I would also say in the long game, we need to start questioning uh, whether we maintain the same sort of diplomatic presence which we've had in the past inside Pakistan, if we no longer have as many consulates functioning in Pakistan, um, then we no longer have as many foreign service officers cycling through being brainwashed um, into the sort of Pakistani lobby. Uh, that's what we need to tackle head on. And that's why the Hindu American Foundation has been so valuable, as has the caucus in, in Congress. And Fatima, coming back to you, we talked a little bit about holding a, a Pakistan accountable for its uh, use of terrorism, but there also has been a similar failure to hold them accountable for their internal human rights abuses and suppression of uh, democracy, suppression of ethnic minority rights. What, what do we need uh, to kind of push that forward? And what would you recommend our some of the steps that we should take uh, from a U.S. perspective in getting great and gaining greater accountability for human rights violations. Um, I think uh, it's been it's been more than ten years, and doing these hundreds of meetings, um, you know, uh, with the with the congressional offices um, and and senators, and it it takes forever this whole energy. But again, they they rely on this. You know, the whole media is a different game. And you talk about the media in Pakistan, that's very much, you know, censored. You cannot publish any article or any report without the approval of ISI or Pakistani army. Um, so there are like so many challenges, but now we are at a point, this is what we have been telling that things are going wrong. It's taxpayer dollars going into a country who is committing all these human rights violations. 
um, and the common people, the common US citizens have to know what is happening with their you know, taxpayer dollars. And we're, we're talking about humanitarian aid that is going there to make the lives of these people better, but that is making their lives harder and actually you know, um, taking away their lives. Um, so I think this is a time because now, um, before we had these reasons, oh, Afghan war is going and Pakistan continued blackmailing US uh, because the whole supply line was you know, through Pakistan. But now I think we are at a point where we are just sitting and billions of dollars disappeared and the situation on the ground is getting worse. Maybe now this is the rock bottom maybe now more people will listen to us, more people will pay attention and pay attention on the real issues on the ground. And we, US has played um, an important role in all that. And Dipali, similar question to you in terms of protecting religious minorities. Um, what do we need in terms of a push from the US uh, policy circles? Uh, what, what are some of the solutions um, that you would recommend in, ter in terms of helping to protect, if there are any, um, you know, not to be a pacifist, um, but it's, you know, the situation is so bad, um, what will actually make a difference in the lives of some of these religious minorities uh, that are seeing their young girls abducted, uh, you know, on a, on a monthly basis? Um, what do you, what would you recommend in terms of policy steps? Yeah, I think uh, Fatima uh, explained it very well that the taxpayer dollars are going to, they're supposed to be for humanitarian aid and they're actually going towards human rights violations. So the amount of um, civilian, is, you know, the amount of aid going into Pakistan is really tremendous from the United States and curbing that aid until and unless um, Pakistan is able to put into practice some of its laws, some of its existing laws, as well as um, be able to support the community um, and actually um, take police reports, for example, of um, instances of violence, whereas now they're being ignored, actually properly investigate and persecute perpetrators. All of that needs to happen. And I think a really, really important part of that is empowering the communities, the disenfranchised communities. So empowering the Baloch communities, empowering the Sindhi communities, and aid should be targeted towards those that are disenfranchised in the country, not the government, which is supporting the human rights, which is creating the environment for, and at sometimes perpetrating the violence against these communities. So there's, there's several things that could be done, but um, the main thing I would suggest is curbing the uh, aid that's going to the Pakistan government and instead supporting the communities that are most in need in the country. Great, wonderful. So I think now formally, we're gonna transition over to the audience Q and A and we have a number of questions that keep coming in. Um, so I'm gonna try to, again, get through as many as possible. Um, we do have about uh, 20, 25 minutes for our uh, Q&A session. So please, if you have not already put in a question, go ahead and use a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And our team is going through those and sending those questions to me as we go. Um, so I have a question here from Ashara the Niyogi. So we have talked a lot about uh, the role of the US government. What is the UN doing? And what is the UN's role in all of this and the international institutions more broadly? And this is for everyone. Uh, Michael, you want to start in terms of at least the terrorism angle and regional um, issues? Okay, when it comes to terrorism, one of the biggest problems we face is that there is no standard international definition of terrorism. This allows all countries to state that they're against terrorism unless they happen to be for a cause with which that country agrees uh, or that country's leadership, or in the case of Pakistan, the ISI agree. And so ultimately this neuters the effectiveness of the UN. Uh, I'm rather cynical about the UN simply because too often countries will um, dump problems on the UN in order to pretend that they are doing something when in reality, they realize that the solution isn't going to come from the UN. Frankly, I think that um, unilateral actions in terms of sanctions, or more ideally, a coalition of like-minded countries acting in unison uh, can have a much greater impact 
than the UN would. And then lastly, when it comes to the UN, as Pakistan has become a vassal of China and because communist China sits on the UN Security Council as a permanent member, um, I would not be optimistic that any solution is going to come out of the UN at this point. Uh, and how about on the human rights end, Fatima and Dibali? Um, what do you see, if any, the UN has, what role, if any, do you see the UN having in that? Yeah, when it comes to individual cases um, and all these different working groups, my, my experience with them is like they require, um, you know, this form to be filled about these, you know, cases. And what we have seen is uh, if one person is abducted, one Sindhi is abducted, if a brother is, you know, filing, um, filing this case with the with the UN, and a lot of times, you know, the other family member is also abducted. So there is a lot of this, you know, with the whole, uh, you know, the bureaucratic system. It's really, really hard for you know people uh, to actually, you know, uh, do something or uh, file their cases. And same is when it comes to religious freedoms and abductions and forced conversions. Uh, people are too scared um, to file their cases or their their daughters with United Nations. Uh, because they know that it will be all there and there will be repercussions. Okay. And yeah, I would just add to that, that um, the Pakistan uh, representative um, to the United Nations, Munir Akram, was the 76th president of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. Um, Pakistan is excellent at lobbying in the United Nations and changing its perception um, within the international community. For example, as insofar as the issue of um, abducted uh, girls that are forced to convert to Islam is concerned, there was a report done called Forced Conversions in Gotki in response to the case of Rina and Ravina, which was sponsored by the European Union. So this research and response again, is being funded by the international community, not only the United States, but uh, other players as well. And it's being used to obfuscate the realities on the ground. So Pakistan is doing a really tremendous job at advocating in the United Nations by being part of a lot of these really, really important uh, committees and commissions um, you know, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, um, Human Rights uh, Commission, all of these um, are places where Pakistan are, is, is a huge violator of human rights and Pakistan is heavily involved in this international conversation and is leading this international conversation. So it's, it's very problematic. And I think the international community needs to start recognizing what's happening here in terms of the UN being used as a way of doing PR um, about uh, a country, despite the fact that there's very real problems at home. Uh, here's another question that I think deals with a lot of the uh, propaganda that the Pakistani government has been dealing with. Uh, has been uh, perpetuating. There's a great deal of investment by the government of Pakistan in lobbying in the US lobbying the US government and activating US based activist scholars and organizations to do the same. What can be done about this if anything? And this is for anyone. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to call on somebody then. Um, Michael, how about uh, you some peers in some of these circles? Okay, well, there, there's two different issues here. Number one is um, the lobbying, and number two is activating scholars. Um, many countries have found out that when their um, positions are just anathema, are indefensible, there's a limit to how much lobbying can actually be successful. And so the antidote to that is simply to expose what their true positions are, uh, because Pakistan can then dump millions of dollars um, down the hole to some various PR firms and so forth, but ultimately it's not going to have much success. Um, again, to make an analogy here, um, Turkey used to measure its, um, its effectiveness in Congress by the size of the Turkish, Amer um, the Turkish Congressional Caucus. And over the last decade, uh, that caucus has lost more than 60 or 70 percent of its members to the point where they no longer publish the list because it's just too darn embarrassing for them. 
And no matter how much money they dump into lobby firms, no one can justify um, support for a government where the murder rate of women has increased 1,700%. Um, now, when it comes to scholars, be careful here. My advice would be there are some scholars who may be on the take and some think tanks which are violating the Foreign Agents Registration Act. But there are other scholars who may simply just be wrong. And the important thing here is not to pillory them or try to score points to show how wrong they are, but rather to convince them that they are wrong and give them a face-saving way to recognize um, a better way forward. And so again, this takes nuance. And one of the one of the great things about the Hindu American Foundation and its um, presence in Washington and so forth is they really do understand the nuance. And so for all the HAF supporters out there, um, I just want to give again another shout out to say that they're doing a great job to win what has to be a constant intellectual battle. Uh, for someone like myself, where everyone at American Enterprise Institute where I work operates independently, we're sort of like a university without teaching. Uh, and because we're relatively small when it comes to the foreign and defense policy shop, you may read uh, vociferously and believe that everyone else understands what's going on, but in Washington, never understand, uh, never assume that people know uh, what's going on in your areas of interest. And so one of the things I find most valuable isn't to be besieged with um, being added on my email, being added on to lists and stuff. That, that drives me nuts. But when someone sees an article that would be of interest to me, uh, they send me a quick WhatsApp or a quick email saying, you know, this is policy relevant. And chances are, even if it may be headline news in Pakistan, it may be the first time I've seen it. And so that sort of outreach, which costs nothing just to educate, I find personally to be very valuable because, again, the core of my work is with regard to Iran. Persian is the language I speak outside of English. And so uh, if my attention is called to other things, for me, that's um, something for which I'm internally grateful. I think you make a great point about the engagement and dialogue um, aspect of it. And I think, um, as you mentioned, that's something that we all take very seriously at the Hindu American Foundation is engaging, even if we disagree uh, with the positions of whether those are government officials, uh, scholars or think tanks or whatnot, but having those conversations and presenting um, other pieces of information, data, et cetera, to help bring them over to understanding our perspective or uh, the reality on some of these issues. Samir, at the risk of putting my, um, embarrassing my hosts or actually not embarrassing the Hindu American Foundation, I'm going to make one criticism of the Indian Embassy, if I may, that for years, many Jewish American policymakers and analysts, the only time we would hear from the Indian Embassy was when we would get invited to a Hanukkah party. And that many of us felt was kind of insulting because we didn't want to be seen as Jewish American policymakers. We wanted to be seen as American policymakers. And so while we appreciate this notion of religious outreach that the Indian embassy was undertaking, um, that shouldn't ever have been the first contact. The first contact should have been a coffee to discuss Pakistani terrorism or the ISI or Afghanistan or human trafficking or many of the other issues in which we truly want to engage as Americans. And so um, as Indian diplomacy in the United States grows, I do think that that is important for some diplomats uh, coming from Delhi to understand. Absolutely. And I think that's why we've seen for so many tech kids why perhaps the Pakistanis have been so successful is because they've understand, understood the rules of the game and the rules of engagement and how to curry favor um, and how to build those relationships. But excellent point. Uh, Fatima and Dipali, anything to add in terms of just maybe addressing more broadly how to counter the narratives that we see here in the U.S. being propagated by different organizations or individuals or uh, lobbying organizations? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the media um, representation, there it's it's a really a struggle to get accurate media representation of some of these things. But when there is accurate re media representation, it's important to amplify those instances, um, show support when the media gets it right, and. Um, Try and if you are uh, connected with the media, if you're uh, informed 
um, about the issues in Pakistan, um, especially if you have family in Pakistan yourself, um, being able to get accurate information to media outlets is really important. So uh, just, you know, it, making sure that the information that um, is out there, it's the media is equally as fraught as these uh, advocacy spaces because there's a lot of competing narratives at play. So, um, so pr providing support for the media whenever possible when they get it right, um, letting them know uh, when they get it wrong and, and respectfully voicing your concern um, with whatever avenues are available to you. Um, and then if you have information uh, that's accurate and you, and you are informed about the issues on the ground, um, making those connections, I think those are some of the things that we need to do to get the right information out there and make sure that everybody's well informed um, and, and not being misguided um, intentionally or unintentionally. Fatima? I think most of the um, points are covered, but in terms of, you know, we are a very small organization and, you know, a small group of number. And it's, it's, it's a huge challenge when we see that because it's been, it's been more than 10 years. Uh, we have a team of researchers. We, we write, you know, articles and try to get them published into the mainstream media. They don't get published. Um, even the letters to editors we have been writing for years uh, that never get published. Um, so th there's a huge, you know, uh, challenge. Um, and when it comes to journalism, I think a lot of what I'm hearing is then, then again, they want to continue getting the Pakistani visa. So this the only re reason is, you know, they, they don't want to get into any of, it, of the dis discussion of human rights violations and these issues. Um, is because they want to continue getting the visa to Pakistan so they can overall, you know, cover the issues and kind of turning a blind eye to the to the real issues that is affecting millions of people in Pakistan. And, you know, um, we, I think we just touched on it a little bit, but um, I want to explore a little bit about what is India's role um, in, in all of this. So if we're to say in terms of um, Dipali first, you and Fatima talking about supporting human rights or supporting refugees uh, from uh, Pakistan or ethnic minorities there, what role can, what positive role can India play in the human rights realm specifically? I think there's a lot that India can do um, in terms of leading the region in human rights issues. Um, there's, you know, there's of course many places, the areas of improvement within uh, within India as well. But there's a lot of things that India is doing right, and uh, in giving, for example, uh, rights to the LGBTQ uh, population, in supporting um, women's rights. There's a you know, there's a lot of um, in supporting um, individuals from disenfranchised communities, either because of class or um, other uh, disenfranchised groups. So there's a lot of um, a lot of leadership that India is providing, and I think India needs to be better at communicating um, about what it's doing, about all of the positive things that it's attempting, and why it's why it's taking certain actions. And so, what India can do is get more involved. Um, and for example, um, Mr. Rubin was very clear that they need to be the Indian embassy needs to be better in its outreach. Uh, and I think the same would go for you know how it interacts with the United Nations. There needs to be more communication. Um, there needs to be more uh, you know advocacy and lobbying from the Indian government about all the things that it's doing because there's a lot that other you know Pakistan and other countries are saying about what they're doing, which are not true or misleading. And so there needs to be, um, you know, a real change in the strategies that, that the Indian government is putting into play. Uh, does that kind of touch on your question? Yeah, absolutely. And in, in terms of, um, you know, obviously the Citizenship Amendment Act came under a lot of criticism back in 2019. Um, perhaps that was a failure of messaging um, because, uh, you know, what it was really intended to do was to help those religious populations, religious minorities that had already fled from Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh, and were in India uh, prior to 2015, and just helping them from a humanitarian perspective. Um, but that has gotten a lot of uh, criticism. But that whole idea of helping refugees, I think that's another component of what India's role can be 
in the region is to help those that are fleeing uh, some of these countries and providing safe haven to them. You know, what would you say is the path forward in that? I mean, do you see India's, you know, expanding its role um, as a place uh, for those seeking uh, refuge, um, those that are persecuted in the surrounding region? Yeah, I think India has always been a home for persecuted religious minorities, and that's been the case historically, whether it's for the Tibetan people, uh, for certain Jewish and Christian communities, and, and many other religious communities that have not found refuge in the region or even, you know, in, in far away, um, in some uh, removed countries such as in West uh, Asia, they've come to India to find refuge. And I think that's that's been the case. And the, the diversity and the inclusion that we see in India is really unique. And that is going to that is going to continue to be the role of India. It, it, it has been a long-standing refuge for minority communities from many um, areas and, and throughout um, you know throughout the landscape of religious traditions that we have um, in the region and it will continue to do so. Now whether or not the international community will provide support for that, I think that's the question. India will continue to do this, but will the international community recognize that? Um, or you know, will the international community kind of play into the hand of these you know, identitarian and um, kind of you know, just misguided politics, which is creating an environment where religious minorities are somehow seen as the perpetrators of violence. Um, you know, seeing um, minorities in places like Pakistan and Bangladesh, you know, as people that need help and then providing those solutions instead of just providing criticisms is something that, um, you know, the international community needs to start stepping up and, and, and providing. Prima, do you see any role for India to support human rights and ethnic minority rights in Pakistan? Yeah, I think majority of the people who have been who have uh, left Pakistan and gone to India, um, and we have seen in the last few decades, they have been Sindhi Hindus, and they they saw uh, it, the whole persecution and especially their daughters being abducted, and these are like the daughters. Um, you know, we we put together this report like daughters gone forever, and one family sees what happens um, to you know uh, one of the daughters they they decided to leave and the easiest for them uh, for these people who don't have enough money was to go to India and you know um, I think the Sindhi Hindus have mostly benefited from the from the uh, citizenship act and that has not been highlighted and I think Sindhi community has this especially Sindhi Hindus and Sindhi Indians have this responsibility on their shoulders to kind of come forward and talk about these things. And that's that's what we saw lacking, actually. Um, I think India has to play an, an important role, especially when it comes to Sindhis, uh, with the whole uh, history um, of Indus Valley civilization and millions of Sindhi Hindus who play a very positive role in the Indian society. They have to come forward. The Indian government have to more openly uh, come in support of uh, you know, Sindhi people, especially Sindhi Muslims who are not considered good Muslims. Okay. And uh, Michael, coming to you on the question of India, I think it's been much debated about what India's role should be now that the Taliban is back um, in power in Afghanistan. Um, whether to open up dialogue with the Taliban or how to now deal with the status quo, um, given uh, Pakistan's obvious, um, uh, you know, work with the Taliban. How would you envision India's role now vis-a-vis um, -vis Afghanistan and Pakistan and what role should it play in the region? Well, first of all, um, about a decade ago, I, actually less than that, about six years ago, I'd written a book on the history of American diplomacy with rogue regimes and terrorist groups for which I traveled to places like um, Korea. And while I was at Panmunjom, where the North Korean, South Korean um, borders meet and the Americans have a presence, one of the things I saw there was how we have just a very technical dialogue with North Korea, which is different from a much broader diplomatic dialogue. For example, in North Korea, at, when there's floods during the rainy season, oftentimes, uh, farmers or kids might fall into the river, drown, and be washed in, and you have to return the bodies. Uh, and there's a very technical dialogue that doesn't reach the newspapers and so forth. And of course, with the Taliban and with India's interests in Afghanistan, 
it's important to have that sort of technical dialogue. But I have to admit, I was shocked at what I saw as some of the wishful thinking from the Indian foreign ministry or some within it, uh, that somehow that they could have a much broader dialogue with the Taliban. Uh, simply this seemed to be motivated by wishful thinking after the Indians had invested as much as they had invested in Afghanistan's development. I would argue it's important not to play into the hands of the ISI or, and this is, a fr I'm afraid, where the Biden administration is, nor be subject to, to um, blackmail in order to keep the hope of dialogue alive. There's always going to be some degree, however, of interaction that it's important that Indians, whether they're diplomats or from the intelligence community, know who their counterparts are in the Taliban, uh, if only to manage at a low level and at a technical level, uh, some of the interactions which need to be managed. Mm -hmm. Um, moving a little bit away from kind of India's role in outside of Pakistan, um, outside of India and some of these uh, broader areas in the region, there was a question coming from, um, I think, Meena Kumari um, that is asking um, more about why the perception of India um, and its religious and purported religious freedom violations has gotten so much traction in the U.S. and specifically why the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom has labeled India as a country of particular concern. Um, if anybody has any thoughts on that or, um, you know, just maybe even more broadly than the, than the youth surf is that why is there so much momentum right now on, you know, focusing on India when we see right across the border and what's happening in Pakistan um, and where this has been happening for the last, you know, dec uh, last few decades. Um, there's kind of a, a renewed focus on India now. And um, not to say again, that as the Bali pointed out, that India doesn't have to improve on its own record, but elevate India to this level as a country of particular concern as USERF is advocating for. Where do you think this is coming from and why do you think this is happening? Michael, Michael maybe if you have any thoughts, we can start with you. Okay, um, my, my thoughts are as an outsider, but certainly there's been a deep-seated bias um, within the US and of course, especially among progressives in Congress with regard to the BJP and Prime Minister Modi, my strategy re um, recommendation would be that be it as it may, that there might be criticism of Prime Minister Modi, that's not a reason to, um, that, that's a separate issue from um, Pakistan's abuse of human rights, Pakistan's um, terrorist sponsorship, Pakistan's relationship with China. And so if, when meeting with a progressive like that, um, I would simply disarm them by saying, you know, we, we can discuss Modi and let's set up a time to discuss it. We can discuss the citizenship law, let's set up a time to discuss it. But holding Pakistan to account for the terrorism, for the rape of young women, for the sex trafficking, for the religious freedom violations shouldn't depend on uh, whether, whether you like someone else's democratically elected prime minister or not. And um, I do think that's a way to get past that initial um, problem we have with regard to USERF itself, look, that's just a sign that uh, HAF's job um, has a hard job ahead of it and the lobbying has to continue. And uh, slowly but surely, I think that as, um, when I look over the past 20 years or so, the trajectory of American foreign policy uh, in a broad bipartisan way is clear. And I don't think that's going to change uh, regardless of who the personalities are in Washington or in New Delhi. Yibali, Fatima, any um, additional thoughts there? I think I would just add that, uh, again, we have to realize when we talk about India, it's a democratic country, and then there is free media. So it's a lot easier. It becomes a lot easier um, to, you know, highlight a um, smaller issue and kind of, you know, make it more, um, you know, on a, you know, bigger um platform, um, you know, that is one. But yes, uh, I think Michael has highlighted the important, uh, very important issues. There, there, there is this imbalance when it comes to, you know, religious freedoms, when it comes to human rights violations, um, you know, this, um, maybe this grudge against one person or the leader of the country, uh, you know, in, in these, um, groups here in the Washington DC kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, translates against the whole, you know, country, the whole society. And um, it, it, it becomes, you know, very, very troubling. 
Um, so I think that there needs to be, you know, balance in that uh, because we see so many issues that are completely ignored, um, the, especially the human rights violations that happen in Pakistan. Yeah, I just want to echo something Fatima said that India is a, a democratic country that has free media. And India is also, uh, the police record, if somebody goes to make a report, they're recording um, these you know, instances of violence. So while there may be um, some instances of violence, and that may be amplified by the media, when something is happening in Pakistan or you know, even Bangladesh um, on the other side, that's not reported often, not only not to the police, but not reported by the media. So there's a, there's a huge disconnect in what's reported by the media, even locally, and what's reported to the police. And that's adding to the misinformation that is creating this environment where India, which is you know, a democratic country that has free media, that is reporting these instances of violence, that is trying to address them when they occur, is those those instances are being amplified ad nauseum while the very severe human rights violations taking in taking place in Pakistan and Bangladesh are all but ignored, um, and 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 the lack of uh, that that huge disconnect I think is is created intentionally by the Pakistan and Bangladesh governments. Not to get too off topic and in, in getting into Bangladesh, but there's there's definitely this. There, it's not reported by the police intentionally. Um, the media is silenced intentionally to create this ignorance about what's actually happening in each of those countries. And that is having dramatic effects and influencing the way that neighboring countries are perceived as well. Um, if, I, if I may just jump in, because both Fatima and Deepali had said something with which I agree, and I want to highlight as someone who works primarily outside of South Asia, um, is the whole issue of access. Journalists are afraid to cover certain issues inside Pakistan for fear that they wouldn't get a visa. The same thing is true with academics. I did my PhD in Iranian studies and people had to be very, very careful what topics they chose uh, because their ability to get tenure, for example, if they went into academe was limited by their ability to get an Iranian visa from the Islamic Republic of Iran. When it comes to journalism and access, um, the Turks keep an unofficial list, and journalists will talk about this, that even if they quote certain people, they will feel that they have red marks against them and they will start losing access. When it comes to the human rights community, India is not alone. Morocco and Israel as well provide a great deal of access to journalists, provide a great deal of access to uh, human rights activists and other NGOs. Uh, frankly, it's a lot easier to live in a place like India, Morocco, or Israel than it is in a place like um, uh, Pakistan, Syria, or Algeria, and therefore people prefer to, and they tend to um, become lazy. They will amplify the criticisms uh, internally while ignoring, as Deepali and Fatima has said, those that occur across the border. What I've found in my work with regard to Morocco, with regard to Israel and so forth is useful, is just to talk about this head on. Uh, the whole issue of access and self-censorship among journalists, because it's something that people outside the broader field simply don't know about or have never really thought about. Uh, but it does seem to, on a logical way, uh, they grasp onto it quickly. There's residence there. Isn't there another layer of that too, where journalists in Pakistan actually face threats to their life. And um, there's been, you know, yeah. in, in recent months and years, a number of journalists and human rights activists that have been killed. Um, and a lot of times there are mysterious circumstances, of course, that's never really solved, um, or the perpetrators are, are, the real perpetrators are never really brought to justice. But it does not add another layer of concern in terms of how information is controlled in Pakistan. I think, yeah, I would, uh, I, like, I can give you one example. Um, yes, journalists and human rights activists are not, you know, safe in Pakistan. It's, you know, very easy to kill them. Um, and, like, in Ju on June 6th, you know, more than 10,000 Sindhis gathered in Karachi. And then there was a complete blackout in Pakistani media. 
like complete blackout in Pakistani media. More than 200, uh, you know, people were arrested, mostly, you know, innocent people who just came out to, you know, protest. Um, and the thing is, the mainstream media here in United States, you don't see anything on the media. You just saw, you know, some things posted by the Sindhi, Sindhis themselves and shared uh, by by them, but we don't see anything on the mainstream media here in the United States. But if that has been the case in any other country, that would have been a completely different story. Rihanna would have come and you know retweeted it. But when it comes to Sindhi people, um, when it comes to Pakistan, they don't have like they just it's like you know, gets very, very complicated because pa Pakistan wants to, uh, you know, show you whatever they want to show the world. That's how they control. They will release a thing that they will think will have, you know, um, better results for themselves. They will open it up and everyone will be writing about it. But then the things that they don't want to sh tell the world, it will always remain, there will be a complete blackout in the media and it, it always happens. Unfortunately, Americans have a short memory and have already forgotten that our very own Daniel Pearl, uh, the Wall Street Journal um, journalist, Wall Street Journal journalist, was also killed in Pakistan. Um, but I think with that, you know, I want to come to each of you just for any closing remarks, uh, final recommendations, and uh, takeaways maybe for our audience as they're kind of now going to be transitioning tomorrow to some virtual meetings with members of Congress. And Pakistan is going to be one of the front and center issues uh, to bring up. Um, anything that you'd like to leave our audience with? Any recommendations or closing thoughts? Maybe Fatima, we can talk. Start with you. Um, I think uh, I would I would encourage you to highlight as many human rights violations um, as possible, especially the individual cases. And to be honest, if a member of the Congress at the end of the day can tweet um, or put a Facebook post out there, or they can do you know flow to speeches to highlight these these cases. And to be honest, we have seen in the past that has saved lives of people. So, you know, I would encourage um, the whole team to highlight these issues and human rights, uh, you know, abuses and the individual cases as much as possible. That's the only way to, um, to save some of the lives. Great, Nibali. Yeah, I, this has been a really rich conversation and, and there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of work that is being done um, by, you know, uh, Mr. Rubin, Fatima, and of course, HAF um, has been a longstanding leader in this space. But I think one of the things that we all need to advocate for is imposing economic sanctions against Pakistan and making sure that um, until Pakistan ends this, uh, you know, essentially creating the environment for and, and sanctioning and, um, you know, not persecuting um, these instances of forced conversion um, un until and unless that happens, it should be uh, sanctioned and there, sh there should be significant uh, curbing of both military and civilian assistance to Pakistan. And instead, we should advocate that this money, uh, this aid should be allocated to nonprofit and community organizations on the ground in Pakistan, which serve the disenfranchised communities um, that the Pakistan government is, you know, uh, trying to uh, silence and eliminate. And Michael, you have the last word. Okay, well, I have no skin in this game. I have no family background in South Asia. I don't take money from anyone aside from my American Enterprise Institute salary, which again, doesn't take money from foreign interests. Um, I look at it just very clearly. Pakistan has been actively sponsoring groups and seeking to kill Americans. India has not. And it's important that Congress not take its eyes off that big picture. When it comes to American diplomacy and foreign policy, never forget, the State Department doesn't make foreign policy. The State Department carries it out. Congress and the White House often make foreign policy and the change is there. In the American mindset, ancient history is 10 years ago, there's traditional inertia. If it's older than 10 years ago, then most diplomats think this is how it's always been done. It's gonna take concerted diplomat, um, concerted lobbying in Congress to change uh, some of our policies of the past. The Cold War is over, we can move on. The Cold War was over uh, 30 years ago. So let's move on. And I think that, I mean, certainly by 
any objective calculation, the future of the United States lies with India and not with Pakistan. Right, wonderful. And with that, we're going to be concluding this morning's session. I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for a really robust conversation and dialogue today on a very complex topic, uh, but one that affects us all as Americans, um, you know, directly on many fronts. So thank you again uh, to Dr. Michael Rubin from the American Enterprise Institute, Fatima Gul, Sindhi American Human Rights Activist, and from the Sindhi American Political Action Committee and Dipali Kulkarni, the American Foundation's Director of Human Rights. I wanna thank all of you, our attendees for joining us and please do join us for our subsequent programs that are gonna be taking place today. We have a, uh, a nice panel coming up on immigration at uh, 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, 10.30 a.m. Pacific. And then we're gonna be rounding out the day with a fireside chat with an Afghan American academic. And that's gonna be at 1 p.m., all right, 4 p.m. Eastern time, 1 p.m. Pacific. So please do visit our website at hinduamerican.org to sign up for those sessions. There's still space. Um, and I wanna thank everyone again and namaste and good afternoon. Thank you.